be supported with national and local advertising with your store name listed in all ads. You'll receive the complete dealer kit with point of purchase material. Make checks payable to Space Sweepstakes, Space Sweepstakes, and mail to Space at 300 North Washington Street, Alexandria, Virginia, 22314. The phone number for Space is 703-549-6990. If you have any questions, you can also call Dave Vengus at the Litchfield Group. His number is 212-598-0600. You can charge it to your Visa, Master Charge, or American Express card. The cost is $300 plus $50 per store if you want the TV spot produced for you that you can tag on with your store's name. Radio spots available, too. This is the Space Dealer Consumer Awareness Program. If you have questions, you can call Space or Dave Vengus at the numbers listed on the screen. Tampa, Texas. In 1981, we set out to build a unique satellite TV magazine. For five years, we've covered all the important satellite news and now bring you over 8,000 hours of satellite viewing each week with the easiest to read grid format. If you own a dish, you need to know. And when you need to know, you need Channel Guide. Only $39 a year. Channel Guide, 800-654-3006. Call now for a free sample. Welcome back. I'm Joe Boyle. With me live tonight is Chuck Hewitt, Rick Brown, and Mr. Dave Frank Abruzzo. Frank Abruzzo, excuse me, Frank. <laughs> Slappy Joe. We do have another caller on the line. Mr. Richardson, I believe, from Pampa. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Gallagher from... Oh, that... Okay, Mr. Baum from New Mexico. Um, <laughs> having tough, a tough time tough here. Time. Your call, your question, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, if uh, the, the FCC says space is free, we, the taxpayers, put up the satellite. How can these companies scramble? That's my question. I believe the question is, since uh, these, since taxpayers' dollars have supported some of the launches of these satellites, the caller uh, argues that maybe this programming should not be uh, supported by subscription since taxpayers' uh, revenues are here at stake. I think, I think the gentleman also said something about the FCC saying that the airwaves are free. The FCC has never said that. Um, the Congress has never said that. And there's some people out there that are, that are selling that proposition unwisely to home or station consumers and dealers alike. It couldn't be further from the truth. Two United States Courts of Appeals and two different circuits have held that pay TV, over-the-air pay TV, which is a use of the airwaves, is a legitimate use of pay TV has been to the Court of Appeals in the D.C. Circuit. Pay TV is here to stay. It's been legitimatized. It's been here for, for a long time. It's been here for, since 1975. It's been held to be, be legal. The airwaves are used for commercial purposes all the time. People make money off of broadcasting, make money off of television, make money off of beepers, make money off of cellular telephones. It is, it, it's a commercial endeavor. It, it has, this country is based on commercial endeavors. And the fact that people are using the airwaves for commercial endeavors is the reason that we allocate the airwaves, is the reason that we have hearings, and the reason we have licenses to make sure that people use these in a fair manner. And what we're trying to do now is go to the Congress and say, look, if they're going to scramble, they have to do it fairly. They're entitled to make money, but they can't gouge the consumer, and there has to be competition. So whoever is selling this theory that the airwaves are free, it never was that way. The use of the airwaves has to be done in a responsible manner. It hasn't been done responsibly when companies in the past said they weren't going to deal, weren't going to sell to us at all. But we have, in this year, won that very significant battle. It's, there's nobody at this point saying that they're not going to make the program available. So we're into, we're into stage two, and that's getting it made 
uh, made available reasonably. And, and we have to look at truth. You know, I think it was Keats that said, truth is beauty and beauty is truth. The beauty of the system is that our voice has been heard. And the truth of the system is that scrambling is not going to be the issue. We're going to have pay programming and non-pay programming. Not scrambled and non-scrambled. It's going to be pay and non-pay. There's going to be a lot of it available for no charge, and there's going to be some where the programmer has to get paid for his endeavors. We want that price to be a reasonable one. Joe, so I'd like to add a couple things to that. I think that, uh, you know, the satellites up there, by the way, are owned by the private companies who put those satellites up. Now, there's no doubt billions of our tax dollars develop the host space capability. But that's also true with almost every major transportation communication system in this country. You have, um, uh, you know, the highways are paid for by taxes, and yet commercial companies use the highways. Trains were built by the government giving away land in which roads were built and made commercial ventures. Subways are built with tax dollars. I mean, there's all sorts of connections between government development. But even the, the more important point is this. When there's 25 and 30 million earth stations out there, and I believe someday there will be, it may be mostly KU banned in 20 years or 25 years, but there will be. When there are that many earth stations out there, the programmers have to be paid or the earth stations are worthless. It won't do us any good if the programmers don't have enough money to keep the programming going. So therefore, it's also of our own vital interest that the programmers get paid, because without them, an earth station is of no value. Chuck, we have another question. Mike from Minnesota. Mike, your question, please. Okay. Uh, what I was going to ask on that there is um, how quick is it going to come to be before the scrambling takes effect? I think Mike wants to know how fast it will be when some of the scrambling will take effect. Mike, uh, the first announcement for scrambling full-time is HBO, which, which will scramble its programming on January 15th, full-time. Nobody else is going to scramble. Uh, none of the major suppliers of programming have announced dates other than July 1. July 1 is a date that has been announced by Cable News Network, MTV, and I believe Showtime and the Movie Channel. However, with those announcements, if you read them carefully, is that they will only scramble if there are sufficient decoders available uh, to the public and the system is working and has proved to be workable. Those are big Fs. And so, um, as I predicted at the top of the show, I don't think we're going to see a lot of scrambling in 1986. I think 1987 is more likely to be the year for it um, if, in fact, we don't get our two-year moratorium. But we, I think we've got now um, a one-year moratorium built in. And, in fact, since uh, since that bill was introduced in March, um, we're going to be pretty close to two years uh, before there is widespread scrambling. It gives us time to adjust to it. So I don't think we're going to see much of it this year, Mike. I might add, though, that show that you're aware of it, Showtime will start testing January 13th. I don't know how long those tests are running per day, but you'll probably see Showtime testing for six and months. And I think the movie channel as well. The movie both, channel along with, uh, but I don't know if it's on both feeds or exactly, but they start January 13th. My understanding today in a discussion I had was that it'll be in the interstitial material, not in the movies not themselves the movies when they start. And I neglected to say that um, one other programming source, uh, that is the common carrier that delivers WOR, which is one of the super station stations, has announced a March date. Uh, for scrambling. We are looking right now at a possible lawsuit uh, to prevent that particular one, and we're looking for some remedial relief in the, relief in the Congress uh, in the interim that will make that, if they scramble, make it available to us. We might add also, as, I, as some of the programmers who say they're going to scramble, saying it's on the basis that the cable head in, 90 to 95 percent of them, pay for the, the scrambler at their end. There are some indications that maybe the cable companies won't uh, want to do that. Was that ESPN for one? Chuck? That was ESPN okay. for one and I think one or two others. Uh, we do have another caller, I believe, from California. Your question, please. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I would like to make a statement here as far as scrambling. The TVRO seems to be under some delusion that we are going to get decoders. I have been in contact with HBO and Maycom. There are no decoders until January 15th, and it looks like those are allocated. 
HBO has uh, been called repeatedly. I've sent their forms in. They keep saying they'll get back. They don't. They refer me to RSI in Merced, California. There are no decoders. We, um, let me tell you, we're under no delusion whatsoever about that, and it's a very serious matter. And I talked to the president of Maycom last week about it. Uh, Maycom is only distributing at this point in time through cable systems and through Maycom distributors. They are not making widespread uh, distribution through other distributors. Some Maycom distributors are only selling decoders to Maycom dealers, trying to get them to buy other Maycom products. I think that's reprehensible. And that's why we're going for this two-year moratorium. And those kind of tricks and games are the kinds of things that we cannot stand as an industry. And that's why I think that we have a substantial chance of getting this moratorium passed, because the distribution me me mechanism that has been put in place is not distributor friendly, not dealer friendly, not manufacturer friendly, and not consumer friendly. And we are under no delusion whatsoever. You're quite right. Now, we did hear today on the other side, and to be fair about it, I think you got a call, Chuck, uh, about the first uh, shipment. The first group of shipments, uh, Maycom told me Monday, would be going out this Wednesday. They'll be shipped to the distributors themselves. They said that by January 15th, there will be 26,000 um, uh, decoders available, and that they are going to start ship, and so that the 1st of January, some of those decoders, they said, would be at the distributors. It's far short of 1.7 million households. Uh, Randy Seth, who is uh, apparently in charge of this at Maycom, absolutely. I think we just lost... We lost that caller. Hopefully, we'll be able to get that caller back. In the meantime, we do have another caller. Your question, please. Uh, Rick, uh, you touched very lightly on the copyright a while ago. Will that cost the TVRO owners extra, or will that be included in the price of the uh, uh, program? The, um, if we work out a mechanism through the Congress to pay for the super stations, I think a fair and reasonable price is 10 cents a month for each one of those super stations. Now, how does that get paid? It will be paid either through the cable operator that's selling the programming to the TVRO customer or through the independent companies that are trying to be established to sell uh, the programming to the, to the consumer. I don't think that a super station ought to cost the consumer more than 20 or 25 cents. And uh, if we can establish those kind of rates uh, through the Congress, um, we'll, we'll get a, a very reasonable rate. We'll get we'll get it the same rate cable does. And we'll try. You know, I think that it'll, it can be passed along at a very in a very reasonable way. So we're not going to be looking at a lot of money for the super stations. Thank you. While we're waiting for our next call, I think Rick, we do have another call. Your question, please. Uh, yes. Uh on the uh, this coalition uh, with the Cable Television Association and, and Space and the common carriers uh, asking for a compulsory license uh, for home dish owners, it says that the uh, cable companies pay a copyright fee. Sure, they make money on it. Why should the dish owner have to pay a copyright fee? Uh, and the reason I say that is uh, does a person watching straight television off the networks have to pay a copyright fee? Uh, it's, it sounds like it's a little bit ridiculous. It sounds like we're at the Mad Hatter's party or something here. Uh, okay. We have to pay, they want the dish owners to pay a copyright fee from a broadcast a super station that is uh, financed by revenue from advertising. It, it sounds a little bit ridiculous. Why the fee, Rick? The, um, I think what you had was half the equation, and, and the part you had uh, was quite correct, and that is that cable does make money off of selling the super station. But the copyright fee doesn't go to the cable operator. The copyright fee goes to the programmers, the movies, the baseball teams, the football teams that are selling their product for redistribution. And they get paid for it when it's sold, let's say, in the Atlanta market or Chicago market, because that's the market they buy. But when it starts getting transmitted to 35 million homes around the, around the United States, they are entitled under the copyright law to a greater payment, and they get that greater payment for the distribution of their product 
through this compulsory license, which means it's a license that has been granted by Congress. And that compulsory license brings to those copyright holders of the superstations, the movie companies, the broadcasters, whoever produces programming on those superstations, the sports interest, $100 million a year. And what the extension of that is a, is an, is a very legitimate and reasonable way to get us to get that programming directly at the same price cable gets it. Probably one of the few times we'll be able to achieve that. And the reason we're paying for it is that the creator of the programming needs to get paid. Otherwise, they stop creating the programming. They are, they are, they are distributing it nationwide via satellite, and they want to get paid for each home. We have another caller on the line. Your question, please. Go ahead, your question, please. Pardon? We're ready for your question. Okay, I'm ready. I turned the television down. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. My question is going to deal with the uh, decoders. Uh, I'm a dealer here in Biloxi, Mississippi, and I've had a, an awful lot of inquiries as to how these decoders are going to work. And uh, having been in electronics all my adult life, I want to know uh, how are we going to hang all of these decoders for every transponder up there on a system? Are we going to have one decoder that will be addressed by all of these transponders, or are we going to have one from uh, HBO and one from Showtime and one from ESPN, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I think the caller wants to know if a decoder will be required for every program service. Uh, Rick mentioned earlier in the, in the program that uh, all the programmers to date have chosen the Maycom decoder. The Maycom decoder has, I believe, it's 55 program carriage capability. In other words, uh, you could have as many as 55 programs scrambled on the one decoder. So in that particular case, uh, the way as, as a de facto standard, there will be one decoder per earth station which will be able to receive all the various scrambled signals. We have another caller. Your, your question, please. Yes, I would like to know about the Justice Department investigation and what are, what are some of the details on that? What are some of the ramifications if we find out there has been, which I feel there has been, some hanky-panky going on? The, the question is that uh, the caller wants to, an update on the Justice Department investigation. Rick? The Justice Department commenced its investigation <clears throat> At the time, prior to the NCTA, the National Cable Television Association, forming what they call the consortium of the major cable operators that were going to create an exclusive pipeline for getting programmers to deliver their programs to the home earth station owners via cable systems. They believed that, the Justice Department believed, that there was an amazing amount of pressure being placed on programmers to scramble signals and to deal in a so-called cable-friendly manner with the cable operators. That investigation also included the fact that the programmers at one time were forming their own consortium for purposes of resisting the cable consortium, forming a group to sell directly uh, to the home. The problem with that consortium was possible price fixing among the competitors. Because of that investigation, I think largely because of that investigation, both of those consortiums have died. The Justice Department investigation has not died. The Justice Department is currently looking at the overall plan, concocted in your words through hanky-panky, to force programmers to scramble, to force them to deal through the cable chain and not through independent chains. And the Justice Department is looking at this whole question, studying it, investigating it. They have people out on the field asking questions, getting answers. They're talking to cable operators, programmers. They're talking to us. I believe unless, unless we get independent means of distribution, independent of cable, that there is a strong likelihood of a Justice Department lawsuit either against the cable industry or against programmers or both. 
investigation is live, it's ongoing, it's a forceful tool for us. I'm very happy that the Reagan administration is pursuing this very vigorous and active course of investigating. What did he said, what does that actually mean to us? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear your question. The question is, what does it actually mean to us? What it means is that unless we can get the whole question of scrambling done in a way that's favorable to the consumer, there may be a lawsuit that has the full power, not only of us, but the full power of the United States government behind it. These kind of antitrust litigations are very expensive, very complex, take a long time, and, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's very effective to have on your side the United States government in one of those lawsuits. What it means also that if we don't get a remedy in the marketplace, the Justice Department is going to take some action to try to ensure that the consumer will have access at reasonable fees. They're going to ensure that there won't be monopolies, and that's what the results of that kind of action would bring. We have another caller. Your question, please. Yes, sir. Do we have a caller on the line? Yes, sir. Y your question, please. I'd like to ask, uh, why should a man have to go to the cable company and pay through a cable company for his satellite service <clears throat> when all through the years we've tried to get cable companies to maybe come out to our part of the county and ask us, you know, to run cable into our area? But they wouldn't do it. And now at the time, they're wanting us to come through and pay through them to get the, the services off our satellite dishes when we put all of our money into buying one. You understand what I mean? Yeah, I, I think you'll find uh, we're very sympathetic to your situation. We've heard that from many, many consumers. We've heard it from uh, a, a good number of people. We, uh, uh, we feel that's what part of our legislation, in fact, that's what our legislation is directed at. The consumer should not be forced to go to only one source, and in this case, the cable operator, to get the programming. He should be able to go to the cable operator or to an independent source to be able to seek that programming and ensure that there'll be competitive pricing. And that's what all of our, that's what our legislation move is and that's what our whole efforts are all about. Frank, as, as a dealer, I mean, that affects you directly. And I know you have some uh, opinions and feelings about this matter in terms of a relationship with the cable company. How friendly is the cable operator on plantation? Not too friendly. Uh, in our area, our cable companies are not very friendly with us. Uh, I happen to have done some work for our cable companies uh, where they have TI problems, where they've had problems pointing dishes, uh, and so on, but uh, they're very reluctant to do anything uh, working with us. Uh, they are now starting to open up their own cable stores in our area, uh, satellite stores, excuse me. Uh, so they are now trying to enter the, the satellite business. We have even interesting uh, thing happens. One of the major MSOs has started a major advertising campaign, similar to those we showed earlier in the show, anti-earth station in Texas, while in Iowa they're selling earth stations. So on one hand, they've got one of their companies trying to <coughs> enter the business and sell, and on the other hand, they're out attacking the whole earth station, saying it's going to be a birdbath and this kind of thing. We have Hedging it all their going, bets. We have it all going in one city. They're uh, they're running ads jointly with other cable companies with their name on the bottom, and in the same city, they're running ads for Satellite, open their own store. So it's obvious they don't know what direction they want to go into. I think they think the business is pretty good, though. There's no question it about sounds that. Sounds like they want to monopolize the business <laughs> to me. <laughs> I, I think we have, we have to be reasonable, too. I think that to the extent a cable operator legitimately wants to sell Satellite Earth stations, I think we have to welcome them into the family. But what we're asking is reciprocal treatment. We don't want them to be the only suppliers of the programming. Because their motivations, for most of them, aren't to get, it isn't to get it to the consumer cheaply. It's to make a potential consumer into a cable customer, not an earth station customer. If they want to enter this business, that's fine. They can sell earth stations. But I think we would be remiss if we ever let go and, and ever stop fighting for the right to be able to sell the programming. It's kind of, let me put it in different terms. You know, there was not too many years ago when you had to buy your telephone from AT&T. You had no choice. Now you can go to a whole variety of different places and buy that telephone. You don't have to buy it from the phone company. It wasn't more than a few years ago that you had to buy your long distance service from AT&T. 
the word, there was no Sprint, there was no MCI, there was no Allnet. Now there's a plethora, a bunch of these other services competing with AT&T, giving the consumer some choice, giving some consumers some price breaks. If we can establish that kind of mechanism in the marketplace, and that's what we're trying to do through the legislation. That's what these companies are trying to do that are out there that have gotten started, that I'm working with. Trying to get an alternative to making the TCIs of the world, the AT&Ts, for the home earth station market. We can't afford to let that happen. We have another call from Texas. Your question, please. Yes, uh, this is Larry Harmon in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, we're enjoying a good festive time of the year, and obviously the worst time of the year that we've ever seen in the satellite TVRO retail market. I don't think it's any surprise as to why that is. Uh, all we've seen in our local media here is how devastating satellite TV has been to the cable companies and how we seem to be the armpits of the new industry. Uh, be it as it may, I think most of the folks that you'll find in TVRO business uh, are entrepreneurs, to say the least. And so I have a couple of questions that I think uh, a lot of the people here in San Antonio, uh, well, incidentally, we did just recently organize here <coughs> to combat that, that sort of technique that the cable companies use, but neither here nor there. A lot of folks come to me in my storefront, and they ask me why the, the cable programming companies such as um, those that we've talked about, HBO, et cetera, expect the consumer to pay a commercial rate. After all, they are not trying to provide service to their neighbors in order to gain a revenue. And why they have to be taxed so heavily in order to enjoy some programming. And secondly, why they should even consider paying that type of rate um, on some of these programs where they don't even have commercials to support them. And I think a lot of the folks here in our area have come to the conclusion that, boy, oh, we'd sure like to see this over with. And if they can hurry up and scramble inside of a gun, boy, we would be happy. Because we're tired of putting up with that type of uh, antagonism to our business. Uh, it sure is a livelihood for us. It's a livelihood for you, because it wasn't for, wasn't for us and the people that we offer product to, uh, your positions wouldn't be as they are. Uh, we always hear about how we won't be fair to the the programmers. Um, I can turn on my, my radio and I can listen to programs worldwide. Uh, no one's ever came to me and said, you can't do that because you have to pay a fee. I'm not totally against having to pay a slight fee, but I think having to charge our people down here or even attempting to have them pay a commercial rate uh, and gouge them in the form of decoders that we can't even get or no one knows where they are. Uh, or if they did, it'd be the cable company that also has the next graph. Um, and if something isn't done soon, and I think that you can find this as a consensus throughout the, the dealer market, that there won't be a dealer market. Um, we struggle, we survive, we see new companies come, we see old companies go. Um, so I think that, you know, it's, it's just word from the, the folks here in San Antonio, Texas is, I wish the heck to hurry up and scramble and get this over with. Uh, the moratorium is nothing going to do anything more than, than delay an issue that needs to be resolved. Uh, I don't have all the right answers, nor do I have all the right questions, but I'd just like to hear some comments on you folks about other people that may have had this, uh, uh, these kind of statements to make. Thank you. We, we appreciate your comments and can empathize with some of the uh, issues that you're going through. Maybe Rick or Chuck can address the... Let me address the, 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 the issue first, and then maybe Rick can address the, the legal aspect of it. I think that that's what we were talking about earlier in the program, the need for the dealers to leap forward as if scrambling was here now. I think what you have to do is you have to say, scrambling is here now. Identify the programmers that have declared themselves as scrambling and saying they're going to scramble. These others aren't going to be scrambling. You'll promote the product based on those facts. And you take it and say, you're going to have, as a consumer, access to every one of those scrambled signals. You can decide to pay for them or not to pay for them. And you'll have, a you'll have access to all the uh, programming that's not scrambled. There's not a cable subscriber in the country will have access to that many programs. Well, there's not a cable subscriber in the country who will have the same amount of choice. So you have a very sellable product. And you're right. Part of that confusion is the fact is it's unsettled now. Leap ahead of that un unsettlement. 
jump ahead, say right now, scrambling's here right now, sell your product on the basis that scrambling is here and now. You're going to say, well, you don't have to pay for it for another half a year, a year or so, but you are going to have to pay for it, but it's still going to have the greatest amount of access. And we believe very strongly we're going to win this war, and the war meaning that you won't have to pay the, the outrageous prices you're hearing being quoted around the country now, that you're going to get a reasonable fee, that you're going to be able to uh, buy it uh, you know, on a competitive basis. Rick? I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to do this in a one, two, three. Number one, you're quite right. The consumer shouldn't pay, the, the Earth Station consumer should not pay the cable rate. I agree with you 100%. That's the thrust of our legislative efforts. Number two, always remember, you're selling the supermarket, cable selling the neighborhood grocery store. You can deliver all the products. They can't because they have limited shelf space. So you're always going to be ahead of them. Number three, I think you're a very far-thinking person. There, the, the notion that we've got to get this behind us, get it implemented in a fair and reasonable manner, is going to add an increased, not a decreased, but an increased air of legitimacy to what we're doing. There was a time, let's look at another industry, there was a time when there weren't very many VCRs sold. They were selling about the same kind of numbers or less than we're selling of Earth stations. And that's when you had to bootleg the tapes. They had bootleg tapes. Finally, when the studio started selling, not giving away, but selling tapes to retail outlets where you could either buy them or rent them, millions and millions of VCRs were sold. That's exactly what's going to happen to us. We can't leap too quickly. We've got to make sure that it gets in place in a proper framework. If it gets in place in a proper framework, then really the sooner the better, because we're going to be like the VCRs, and people are going to buy that product, and the price is going to come down, and it's going to be competition. You've got, mil you've got millions of, uh, well, millions is too, too many. You've got thousands, literally thousands of stores selling and renting videotapes in this country. 20,000. 20,000. And that, that's what makes it happen. We're going to take one last call. Your question, please. Hello? Yes, we hear you. Go ahead with your question. OK. Uh, it's not really a question. It's more of a comment. Um, I think, uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm in favor of the two-year moratorium on scrambling. And uh, I believe that we, we definitely need to work with Congress to try and get reasonable rates. I was at the Washington rally. and. Uh, voice my opinions to my congressman. But I think one thing we're missing or failing to, to see is uh, we're going to have several million dishes here very soon. We've already got two million in the country. And uh, supply and demand and uh, free enterprise is going to take care of a lot of this on its own. What you're saying is that, uh, uh, if, I, if I have you accurate, you're saying that you feel a lot of, a lot of the marketplace will take care of this, uh, you believe? Yes. Well, I guess the reason we are reluctant to rely on the marketplace 100% is because that right now, the cable operators, uh, the, all the programmers are totally dependent upon the cable operator for their sources of revenue. TCI, with 5 million subscribers uh, to themselves, or portions of subscribers of 5 million, Showtime only has 5.1 million subscribers. So you have one, one cable service that has more subs than Showtime does nationwide. So you see there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, control on the part of the cable industry of every programmer. Because, and there's also some interrelationships between programmers and cable companies in terms of intercompany uh, ownership. With that kind of situation, you have a, a monopolistic distribution setup. The marketplace isn't really operating. The marketplace is really at a dead standstill. You have a monopolistic operation. We have to make sure that free enterprise takes over. When free enterprise takes over, then you're absolutely right. The marketplace will take care of this, but not until there we break the monopoly distribution of programming. Thank you, Chuck. We've run out of time, and that's the last question we can take right now, and I want to thank our guests, Frank Abruzzo, Rick Brown, and Chuck Hewitt, and we'll be going back to our set, and Robin Neidert will be giving the closing comments. Thank you. That's the show for tonight, folks. Next week, that's Christmas Eve, Space Showtime will be here with a very special Christmas program from Texas, featuring Pat Porter and Pat Olson. 
They've got a terrific show in store with some special season surprises. So don't forget to join us Christmas Eve, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, same place as tonight, that's SpaceNet 1, Channel 19. Then on New Year's Eve, Space Show Time will be right here with its year in review. Special guests, industry representatives from the media will be here to take a look at the year's events and to discuss their predictions for what 1986 holds. So join us here New Year's Eve, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, again, SpaceNet 1, Channel 19. And as you know, all of the Space Showtime programs are repeated Wednesdays at noon. Starting with the repeat on January 1st, that's New Year's Day, Space Showtime will have a new home right next door, still on SpaceNet 1, but moving to Channel 17 instead of Channel 19, starting January the 1st. The holiday seasons have descended here on Washington, D.C., and all of us in the nation's capital wish you a peaceful and joyous holiday. We encourage you all to have yourself a merry little Christmas and to take a moment in the holidays and remember those less fortunate. See you next week, SpaceNet 1, Channel 19, Christmas Eve edition of Space Showtime. This is Robin Neidert. Thanks for joining us, and good night.